Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, Blockchain Myths versus Relevance for the Textile Industry. Today's presentation will be recorded and sent out to all registered participants and also will be posted on the Hub. We will have a Q&A portion at the end of the presentation. You can type your questions into the question box on the webinar doc. Any unanswered questions will be answered afterward via email. Now on to Yvonne Tan, Director of Data Management and China Strategy with Textile Exchange. Yvonne? Hi, everybody. Thanks for taking the time today to join us on the first of the three-part series um, on digital innovations and traceability. Uh, joining me today is Amit Gautam, CEO and founder of Textile Genesis, a fiber to retail digital traceability platform enabled by blockchain for the fashion and textile supply chain. So Amit has a very, very um, interesting background combining uh, textile and technology. So he's, he's in the best position to, to talk to us about this topic. He was the executive vice president of the global textile business at Lensing, um, board director of Lensing China. He was also the associate partner at McKenzie, and he has a background in technology as well. So uh, a per perfect storm for talking about digital innovations and traceability. Um, I'm Yvonne Tan, I'm the data management director um, in Textile Exchange. I've been with Textile Exchange for about 10 years now. Um, I lead the work in the data center um, my previous background was in IBM and PwC consulting, focusing on data and system transformation. So, um, Amit will start us um, with today's session, talking about some creating transparent supply chain, uh, laying the groundwork on blockchain basics and landscapes. And then um, the second part, um, I will speak a little bit about the role of um, sustainability standards uh, with relations to um, blockchain and traceability. So on that note, Amit, I hand it over to you. Thanks, Yvonne. Thanks a lot. <clears throat> and it's really great to see a, a very strong participation. So I'm very excited. Um, so let's move on. Yeah, so I think the main topics we would like to cover today is the basics about blockchain and also some of the uh, key developments that we see uh, cutting across both uh, in the technology space, but specifically dive deeper into the textile industry and where we see uh, the relevance and some of the key success factors to scale up a technology like blockchain, for example, for uh, digital traceability. Yeah. So let's move on. No, great. Before I get into a blockchain, you know, I have just a very simple, I would say a quiz for the participants. And unfortunately I can't hear back the answer, but let me anyhow uh, share that with you. Uh, if you compare fashion and textile industry with automotive and consumer electronics, uh, you see a quite some significant differences, right? Uh, and I'll come to that. If when you look at automotive and electronics, the top 10 brands drive almost 80 to 95% market share. And if I ask you for fashion and textile industry, what do you think is the market share of top 10 brands? And how big do you think is textile and fashion versus automotive and electronics? So when I ask this question, uh, especially with uh, you know, participants from the fashion industry, typically I get an answer that it's between electronics and automotive. And normally I get a, on the market share, the response is maybe top 10 brands have 20 or 30% market share. So let me break the suspense and, and share the actual figures. The top 10 brands in the fashion and textile industry have close to 10% market share. And the industry overall is much bigger than consumer electronics, almost double, and also bigger than automotive. Now, what's interesting, unlike automotive and electronics, where the market share is actually declining and sorry, getting concentrated over the top 10 brands, in fashion and textile industry, the market share of top 10 brands is actually decreasing because more and more brands are increasingly 
launching sub brands. If you look at, for example, H&M as a group, I think in the last uh, three to four years, they have launched three new brands. And this is the same story. If you look at uh, Inditex group and also the large uh, you know, fashion brands. So not only the market here is small, it's actually uh, declining over time. Now, why is it important? It's important because the fragmentation of the industry drives the need for higher transparency and traceability because the industry becomes far more opaque and it's far more time consuming and costly to create transparency and traceability. Now, when you look at automotive and electronics, you know, if you go to an Audi or a Volkswagen, you know, these guys have very good traceability of all the tier one components and tier two and tier three because first of all, the market is relatively concentrated and second, it directly affects the performance of the product itself. Now in textile, not only the retail is fragmented, but if you move on to the next slide, then what you will see uh, is the value chain is also is highly fragmented. So Yvonne, if you move on. Yeah, so this is where you see uh, the textile value chain uh, is highly fragmented all the way from, of course, in the case of farm, uh, in fiber production, except in the case of, you know, synthetics and wood-based cellulosic fibers, uh, very fragmented when you look at, uh, for of course, in cotton and also in the wool. And further downstream, spinning, weaving, knitting, dyeing, finishing to garment making, uh, you know, the top 10 players have, you know, maybe four or five percent market share, highly, highly negligible. Uh, very similar to what you see in the retail, right? So not only the retail part being fragmented, but the fact that it's extremely long and fragmentation continues in each and every step in the value chain makes it more very complex to create uh, traceability, time consuming and at times costly because the supply chain dynamics continue to change and evolve, right? So now let me move on to actually uh, then going deeper into uh, what blockchain is and how it can create value in terms of uh, creating traceability uh, and transparency in the fashion industry. So if you move, yeah. So blockchain essentially uh, has three distinct features. Uh, at the most basic level, it's actually a database. I'm sure most of you have worked in Excel sheet. Yeah? Excel is nothing but a very simple way to store data. Now what's special about blockchain as a database is that once you write something on it, it's not possible to alter it, to modify it, to erase it because it's immutable to all the parties involved. But that's also quite important because you have to be careful what you write on it because if you write BS, it stays as BS, right? So the data integrity and quality becomes even more important when you use blockchain uh, uh, as, a, as a database technology to write the transactions on it. But because it's immutable, it's a very safe way to conduct transactions, very verifiable, and creates a certain level of trust between parties because they know for sure uh, that once they agree to something and, and, and write it using blockchain as a technology, uh, it cannot be unilaterally uh, modified. You can write another transaction, but all have to agree uh, to that new transaction. The second important thing about uh, blockchain is the fact it's designed for mapping transactions and linking transactions to each other. And because of that unique feature and functionality, it's an ideal database to use to create a chain of custody. It's an ideal database to use if you're looking at a supply chain audit trail. It's an ideal database to use if you're looking at uh, supply chain traceability aspects because of the fact that it connect transactions to each other and that's a natural inbuilt feature uh, in, in the blockchain as a database. In others, if you use an, another technology, you would have to then uh, do additional amount of, I would say, customization and programming uh, to bring that feature. And the third uh, important aspect of blockchain is the fact uh, that you can digitize uh, physical assets. Now, this is a conceptual breakthrough. You can achieve it with or without blockchain but the conceptual breakthrough actually comes from the, um, the blockchain philosophy of thinking. And the idea is that any physical asset, for example, you know, a textile product or a food product, that you can create a digital token, a digital 
twin of the physical product. And as the physical product moves along the supply chain, the digital twin moves along as well, exchanging hands between the parties, thereby creating a natural trail across the system and a history of the ownership of the digital asset without any need for actual, you know, uh, any paper trail or a, or a file trail. Now, those are three very distinct features of blockchain. Now, you would have uh, seen that I have not even once talked about blockchain, uh, sorry, uh, bitcoins. <laughs> and uh, so Bitcoin is actually uh, one of the unique application of, of blockchain. And, uh, and because it was one of the first areas where blockchain was applied, people sometimes uh, think synonymous about Bitcoin and blockchain, right? But that's one of the first applications. Probably, I would say right now, 99% of the work happens in cryptocurrency space and in the fintech. But we believe the maximum value that it can create is actually in the supply chain uh, traceability, in supply chain authentication, uh, in eliminating counterfeiting. And this is where we see increasingly more activity uh, than in the fintech world. Let's move on then to the uh, next slide. Yeah, at the topmost level, you could imagine that all blockchain platforms you could structure into two uh, distinct categories. One is a public platform, which essentially means anyone can join. You can join anonymously, so no one knows what your identity is, and everyone pretty much sees everything, right? Now those public platforms make sense, you know, when you talk about cryptocurrency, which, which is Bitcoin, Ethereum, and uh, several other uh, uh, cryptocurrency-based platforms, uh, because you know this is uh, that is the space where actually uh, anyone could join and can start conducting transactions. That's how it's designed. Or some of the public ledgers where uh, the national governments are actually uploading uh, some of the land registration data. Uh, even in some countries, some of the uh, specific aspects around uh, identity and so on and so forth. So it's easy to verify and no one can actually, you know, uh, alter it. Uh, but those are the specific and unique aspects of uh, a public platform. Anyone can join, especially anonymously, and actually there are no access controls so and everyone sees pretty much everything. Then on the other spectrum, you have what are called permissioned platforms. Now in a permission platform, uh, essentially it's, a, it's a, a blockchain system that works within a set of uh, uh, ecosystem of players uh, where each user is authenticated. So you know the identity of the player that you're interacting with. And there are clear access controls on who sees what based on confidentiality, based on competitive information, so on and so forth. I think based on those two explanations, I'm sure you would have already drawn conclusions uh, that which kind of platform fits better for modeling a supply chain in an industry, right? And that's where the permission pl uh, platforms are used more widely, where you see enterprise value chain networks, you know, IBM's Hyperledger, and they have about uh, 10 different platforms in Hyperledger being used in supply chain, in food industry, uh, in financial sector, uh, you also see some very specific uh, blockchain platforms between banks to be able to uh, very quickly send foreign remittances and receive uh, foreign remittances, which currently, you know, if you have to send a cross country, you know, a cash transaction or sorry, a transfer of money uh, between banks, you know, let's say from US to Europe or Europe to Asia, sometimes it could take several days uh, for the transaction to be actually uh, realized. And uh, in a blockchain-based system, actually that can happen relatively instantaneously or definitely within a day, and sometimes actually within a couple of hours. And this is where you see some of the networks like Code and R3. But the main point here is that permissioned platforms is where you see maximum application as far as uh, industrial relevance is concerned for supply chain traceability and for companies and legal entities to interact with each other. Now, if I move on to specifically to the textile value chain to the next page, uh, uh, Yvonne, yeah. Uh, in, within the textile industry, there are essentially two key meaningful 
uh, traceability uh, relevant challenges that require urgent attention and that could potentially be solved by blockchain. It doesn't have to be, but blockchain could play one of the building blocks of the uh, technology ecosystem to address those problems. The first uh, is authentication of the finished apparel product itself. You know, if you look at uh, European Union International Patent Office data, 10 to 15 percent of all goods imported into Europe are fake, right? And this is public data based on uh, looking at the goods that were caught at customs uh, within the European borders while the goods were being imported into Europe. It's a significant number once you look at the total amount of fashion related sales that's, an, uh, that's actually happening in Europe. You're talking about several billions of euros actually being counterfeited in terms of finished product. Now that's one unique problem that blockchain could potentially solve and, uh, and is being very actively looked at, especially if you look into the uh, luxury retail and also couture industry. Uh, that's where they're very actively uh, uh, looking at uh, to authenticate the finished apparel products itself or leather bags or shoes because sometimes the value of the items uh, could be in several hundred euros, in few cases even in thousands of euros when you really look at the high end of the market. The second distinct problem which is meaningful, which is relevant and uh, requires urgent attention uh, is traceability of sustainable fibers in the finished product itself. You know, there are very strong claims uh, when you look at around organic fibers or recycled fibers uh, that are increasingly uh, uh, used in the, uh, let's say, in the finished garment itself. Uh, when you look at the top 100 fashion brands, apparel brands, majority of them have announced 100% sustainable fibers target in the next three to five years. So 2023 to 2025, maybe some brands have even gone to 2028. And those 100% sustainable fibers uh, cover, you know, your uh, recycled polyester, your organic cotton, uh, wood-based cellulosic fibers. But the key challenge there is the, the lack of clear traceability across the tiers of the supply chain to be able to verify what the underlying supply chain is, to be able to verify the sustainability credentials of the players involved in the supply chain, and to have the traceability back to the origin of the fiber. And our estimate is maybe in some cases, uh, up to 30% of uh, uh, textiles that are claiming to have sustainable fibers, either at the level of yarn, or at the level of great fabric, or finished fabric, or garment, at any of those stages, the claims that are being made that the inputs being sustainable uh, textile fibers could be fake. And that creates a significant challenge uh, for the industry because it has direct impact on a brand's reputation. You know, if a particular uh, fiber, uh, finished garment is being claimed to be sustainable and doesn't, it creates very uh, uh, strong, let's say, legal and compliance risk associated uh, with the brand. It creates a uh, uh, also, it affects the brand reputation and, and equity, as we have seen in some of the, uh, I would rather say, the scandals that happened last year, uh, where you know a certain claim was being made around a uh, specific origin of cotton, and it was not, and it created huge issues, you know, in terms of recalling product uh, from the shelf space for a brand, in terms of refunding customers uh, who have already bought the product, and now. In, in that specific example, three brands even have a class action lawsuit in US. So those are the two distinct, meaningful, and large problems that uh, blockchain could potentially solve uh, in the fashion industry. And the focus uh, of textile genesis is to address the second uh, challenge, which is around digital chain of custody in terms of providing traceability for sustainable fibers from the finished product across to all tiers of the supply chain. Right, so if we then move on to the, yeah, so that's our focus on the second one. I just mentioned it, yeah. Now, if we uh, take a step back and say, okay, what are uh, some of the key design principles or key metrics to measure the success of a digital chain of custody? We have defined five key uh, design principles uh, that you drive a successful application 
of blockchain or digital traceability you know in, in fashion or textile industry so let's start with the first so the first principle very very important uh, that any initiative will be successful we believe in the in not only in textile but actually any industry if there is an industry wide engagement industry wide collaboration between brands between fiber producers between certification standard owners like textile exchange and of course the textile suppliers that's quite fundamental to success of any traceability platform whether you use blockchain or you use any other digital technology if the industry players do not come together to drive you know a, a standard to drive consensus around how the data is exchanged uh, to drive a consensus on a certain uh, traceability protocol uh, then there is no way you could actually scale it across the industry and one of the very important players in this uh, system is actually the textile suppliers themselves very often we overlook you know a spinner a fabric mill or a garment maker because there are lots of them but actually those are the textile players who actually are i would say the the you know the nuts and bolts of any traceability system and it's very very important to create right incentives for the textile suppliers all the way from spinning to weaving knitting to dyeing houses to garment making uh, the right incentives for them to actually share traceability data for them to contribute to transparency and if you ask me honestly right now uh, there's not that much incentives we offer them right and that's one of the things we are quite uh, looking very carefully how do we fundamentally change those dynamics to incentivize the players uh, along the value chain to contribute to transparency and traceability the second important uh, design principle uh, is essentially if you know when we talk about the tokenization uh, uh, as an important concept uh, in blockchain where you can create a digital twin of the physical sustainable fiber uh, uh, by that particular aspect you can actually control the amount of certified material entering into the network but at the same time you have to find a way to connect the physical world with the digital world and that's where the integration uh, you know with several fiber verification technologies that are out there uh, be it a chemical marker or a dna marker or a natural fingerprint we have to recognize that these uh, Two things do not compete with each other you know or creating a digital traceability system versus the physical verification of uh, of the product they actually complement each other and very importantly if you have a very strong data on transactions and the velocity of transaction and which product is moving fast or which one is moving very slow or which step in the supply chain you see a very high inventory or which supplier is actually shipping a very high volume of uh, order to its downstream customer which looks as an outlier if that data is there you can do a risk based verification of the textile product rather than a random sample audit and the the biggest difference is you significantly reduce the cost because you can be far far smarter in terms of where you want to do an audit uh, both at the system level or also at the uh, physical verification level so the second very important uh, aspect is to connect the physical with the digital world because then it creates a significantly robust system than only having a physical uh, system versus only having a digital system then the third important aspect uh, is that uh, it must be very easy to use and deploy right now if you go and talk to any of the suppliers right they don't care whether you have blockchain or not they don't care what kind of you know uh, fancy system you're trying to launch all that they care about is look can i use it easily do i have to put my people you know days and days to train uh, do i have to you know have my people days and days to enter data into the system or can it be a very simple system to use so which means very little amount of training that's needed and very little in uh, you know time required to input uh, authentic data into the system so as we think about you know uh, across the industry the ability to cut down on the manual inputs 
uh, to be able to extract data from their ERP system or SAP system or whichever system they're using, or even to have very simple templates where they can actually uh, store data, which could also help them structure their uh, work anyhow, uh, is the way forward versus, of, versus what we see many times, a lot of manual inputs being used to actually feed data into a system. And that would that will also take care of you know which a commonly used phrase in the in the technical uh, and in the IT sector what we call uh, GIGO you know garbage in garbage out, and I think Yvonne will also talk about later about that. And the more easy uh, we make the system to use and deploy, you reduce that effect of garbage in and garbage out. Then if you move on to the fourth uh, principle, uh, interoperability. Right now, that is quite a mouthful. And then you say, okay, what exactly are we talking here? The ability of a system to be able to listen and communicate with other external systems, such as the fabric certification systems uh, of a fiber producer, or uh, you know, external system of a certification body, or the CDS of textile exchange. The interoperability of a system essentially means that system is not stand alone. There's no system that can exist if it's primarily stand alone. It must be able to interact and communicate uh, with other external systems in its ecosystem. And if it's not able to do that, if it doesn't have the functionality to do that, uh, then of course it's not a smart, smart and a robust system because we have to recognize the fact that we will not have one system that runs everything will have multiple systems in the market and then the interoperability becomes extremely critical to be able to interact uh, with the other systems where the data might be required to be to be fed into and finally uh, it should be able to model you know very very broad supply chains it cannot be specific only to one fiber type uh, and for example in the case of wood based cellulosic fibers it should be able to capture the data around you know canopy ranking on fsc certificate pefc at least at the level of production site where the manufacturing of viscose or lyocell or modal fibers is happening because that gives the credentials around the source of wood is authentic uh, in recycled polyester you probably want to go back to the pet bottle collection entity because there are a lot of uh, social issues uh, with respect to child abuse and child labor being used and how the PET bottles are being collected. Uh, in case of wool, you want to be able to go back to the farm. And in some of these cases, of course, as you're talking about textile exchange, you know, you have to be able to find a way to capture you know, the GRS certificates and RWS certificates in cellulosic fiber, there's no standard. So we have to look at other uh, way of creating a traceability protocol. Uh, so the ability of a model to be flexible, to be able to ma uh, model very different value chains in the uh, textile industry uh, is quite important because uh, that's the nature, that's the market reality of this industry, that you have very different fibers that are used across the system. And, and connecting to that point is the, around flexibility is, is that it should also be able to offer, a, 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 let's say, a window uh, where through which one can engage a consumers either through app or through you know sharing the data on online browsing the transparency layer you know, once you have created a very strong traceability backbone uh, uh, at the end of the day what you want to be able to do as a brand and even some of the uh, fiber producers is to be able to engage consumers to tell the authentic story around traceability uh, to be able to share with them you know why this particular garment you have to pay you know 150 euros and not for 20 euros is actually because you have put a lot of effort in creating a very strong sustainability backbone there are very strong sustainability credentials uh, so having uh, the ability to tell a consumer story uh, at the point of sale is also quite important uh, one other aspect that i want to highlight which we uh, 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 actually discovered while conducting uh, pilots with uh, several brands and fiber producers is the ability to conduct some critical business validations uh, uh, is increasingly becoming important especially in the digital world right so i make it very practical for you so for example uh, in one of the cases you know we were uh, looking at 
the blend ratio of the fabric uh, must match with the blend ratio of the input yarns being used or the blend ratio of the garment must match the blend ratio of the input fabric articles that is composing that specific garment article or garment product number. Now that sounds quite simple, but you will be surprised. In many cases, those validations to, are impossible to do because the data of fabric mill is sitting on a different system or on a piece of paper, versus the garment data is sitting maybe in a PLM system. Or when you talk about fabric with the input constituents of yarn, it becomes even more difficult because they're coming from two different suppliers. Now in having a digital, uh, 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 that's a chain of custody or digital traceability, those automatic critical business validations that uh, removes the error around uh, claims being made at the point of sale can be done automatically. And that is a big plus when you think through any digital uh, chain of custody solution. And that's just one example of a business critical validation. And I think as we move forward, we'll probably um, identify several more uh, that's important uh, specific to the uh, textile industry. So I've been, uh, I've talked enough. <laughs> I should take a pause now and then uh, hand over to Yvonne who would then, uh, uh, you know, take us from, let's say 20,000 feet to the very practical world of, you know, how it can be thought about in the textile industry. Uh, so Yvonne, over to you. Thank you, Amit. So next, I'm going to touch on, Amit has highlighted on some of the capabilities and the key design principles uh, of blockchain and the power behind these technology. So it's, it's all very exciting. And before we all jump into this blockchain bandwagon, it's really, really important to first take a step back and look at blockchain in the context of um, the sustainable textile landscape. So Textile Exchange is a certification scheme. We write um, standards and, you know, uh, in our world, this is, this is how um, we lay the landscape down. When we look at the textile supply chain, we can basically split it into sort of three essential elements. Um, we have the physical process. So, you know, as the particular material flows down the supply chain, um, in, in this example, um, you know, it's farmed, it's ginned, it's, um, it's, it's spun, it's knitted, woven, and made into a particular garment. Um, and that's where the, the physical process actually takes place. And then you have the physical material, um, and it changes form uh, across the supply chain, from a cotton ball to, to fiber, uh, yarn, fabric, and so on. Um, and then finally, we have the information flow. And when we're talking about blockchain or any chain of custody solution, really, we're really talking about the information flow. And that is quite distinct and separate from how the physical material and the processes in which that material has endured throughout the supply chain. Um, Amit has also spoken a little bit about the issues, uh, you know, integrity, traceability, authenticity of the physical material. And essentially a standard really aims uh, to address is to set some of these baseline requirements, um, both for the physical process, uh, for the physical material, and create essentially um, some validation into a digital chain of custody. Um, and irrespective really of whether that technology platform is centralized or decentralized, that, as I mentioned, that information flow is quite separate from, from how the physical material is processed and um, changes form throughout the supply chain. Um, Amit has also mentioned the term garbage in and garbage out, and that quite aptly outlines the boundary of the information flow. Um, for that information, chain of custody to carry good information, there first needs to be a level assurance that happens uh, both at the physical material and as well as how that particular material um, is processed across the supply chain. And that's really where, as I mentioned, the sustainability standard kicks in. Um, it provides a baseline requirement, how those requirements must be met. And a third party in textile exchanges case, third party verification and assurance that those materials are processed correctly 
it's authenticated, um, and that that information, the correct information, is validated and goes into the chain of custody and then carried through. And of course, um, there is efficiency to be gained, and uh, Amit has already spelled that out, um, through the use of innovation, innovative technology on how that information can, can best flow through the supply chain and really make a, a very complex information flow um, and you know, using automation um, and systemization to make that work better, more efficient. For those who are familiar with textile exchange standards, our standards provide process assurance through site level verification. So um, in our language, you, we use scope certificates. Um, we are increasingly uh, adopting physical material authentication through the incorporation of fiber forensic audits. Um, and we're working on in terms of the information flow, um, centralizing our database to systemize our transaction certificate. So those are some of the areas that we are working on. But beyond that, we also recognize that we can do better. Um, technology will increasingly evolve. It will become more efficient. Um, and as we look ahead, we recognize that, you know, um, what are some of the areas that we can make our chain of custody more, more faster, more accurate, and hopefully more cost effective. And blockchain as a disruptive technology, we find could be a potential, a uh, good answer to this. Um, by breaking down our current transaction certificate chain of custody into digital assets, one possibility is to trace the particular article down to its lower level um, by decoupling uh, the need to aggregate shipments. And, and so that information flow could happen faster and in more real time. By systemizing the information flow between certified entities across the supply chain and the chain of custody platform itself, we could possibly automate and validate transactional certified data against enterprise data. And I've spoken about that. Um, you know, reducing redundancy, um, making that information, uh, which is automated, uh, more accurate. Um, and by, by reducing the need for duplicate checkings um, and increasing the use of automation, we could also re reduce um, uh, move from sort of a, a, a manual checking every single transaction to a more risk-based assessment. So all in all, we, we expect, um, you know, the incorporation of these kind of digital information, in, innovation uh, into our chain of custody to, to present us quite potentially good results. Um, the question we have is really, how does that fit with our standards and is it really scalable? Can, can the industry, is it readily, um, can it readily be adopted by the industry? So we're trying to address this two questions um, with Textile Genesis in uh, October 2019 in Vancouver um, conference, Textile Exchange and Textile Genesis entered a collaboration arrangement to explore um, our chain of custody against uh, a Textile Genesis traceability platform. Um, we're very excited, um, you know, for this partnership because um, Textile Genesis has uh, sort of been awarded Fashion for Goods Innovation Program and also won the Global Change Awards for its innovation in, in, in this area. Um, and the, the, the project really is to address three fundamental objectives. One um, is to use a blockchain enabled technology to pilot the use of our standards. Um, what does it look like? Um, um, you know, using sort of a digital asset to trace uh, sort of the certified materials, some with our standards, some without, um, and assess our, and the, assess the fit of this digital traceability solution against our chain of custody. Um, so we've developed an assessment framework and we will retrospectively see how our standards work uh, on, on blockchain, what is needed, what needs to be additionally added in. Um, and the output of that really is to develop a white paper uh, on the gaps and opportunities 
which we will feed into our um, content plane standard uh, revision. Um, so that is something that we are looking forward to to um, to explore further with textile genesis and you know adopting um, more innovative uh, technologies into our chain of custody. So on that note, we have a few minutes left. So um, I'm going to see if there are any questions. We do have a few, Yvonne. Yeah, so um, I just okay. uh, answered one just to, uh, just to share, right? So there was a question from Mark uh, prior that just to clarify public platforms uh, do not necessarily allow visibility to everything only if the architecture does not properly implement uh, encryption and zero knowledge technologies. Uh, so that's true, Mark. And we're just trying to keep it to uh, key generic principles to show importantly the distinction between public versus permissioned uh, without going to the specific aspects of uh, implementation. Uh, then there's one question from uh, Gary Bell, which says, can you touch on the ideas behind the challenges of multiple lingualism in any global system? I think that's a very, very uh, important and interesting point because of the fact that textile suppliers and the textile uh, supply chain is uh, quite uh, you know, heavily focused in Asia and also in some of the countries where language, uh, uh, you know, common language is not English. So when you talk about mainland China, uh, also in Turkey, uh, plus in other countries in Asia, uh, you need to have uh, multiple uh, language support. So we, at least at Textile Genesis, what we are planning to do is uh, uh, launch uh, a system also in um, uh, simplified Chinese and Turkish uh, later this year, beginning of next year, exactly to the point that you mentioned to have multiple language support. Um, then there's a question from uh, Sylvie. May I ask you an example of how the blockchain is used through phones? Thanks, a lot of suppliers are not very equipped. Uh, so Sylvie, when we talk especially about the traceability data, or what we expect uh, is that they would be using uh, their existing uh, uh, you know, invoice or purchase order or ordering system to uh, extract the data from that system to upload uh, to uh, any traceability system th uh, that they're using, which is, you know, could be multiple or even could be uh, TG. Now that's quite uh, uh, different and distinct from uh, the phone part, as you rightly point, because to be able to use a phone, you have to have that every single uh, good that's being shipped has a QR code or a barcode or a crypto code, some kind of a machine readable uh, tag attached to it. And that's practically as uh, not possible uh, if you look at you know how fragmented the industry is and how uh, uh, distributed it is between uh, different countries to be able to have that common standard being followed across uh, all the suppliers. Maybe it happens in future, but to begin with what we see is uh, interaction between their uh, ordering system, purchase order system, ERP, SAP system, and then uh, uh, a digital traceability system. Um, then there's a question from Jene Ruda, which is around how can the TETG blockchain system ensure sustainable economic and economic circularity of, to fairly distribute benefit to family farmers, cooperatives, and local communities, uh, and then a hybrid public private governance. So, uh, Jean, I, on this particular aspect, I think uh, uh, it's a very interesting question. I'm, I'm just uh, thinking as I'm speaking. Uh, essentially, what I would imagine is uh, if you have a very clear uh, traceability and a chain of custody, uh, we believe that it would uh, drive fair prices towards those products versus what we see in the market. Uh, many times the product is not being produced fairly with sustainable credentials, but you still can attach sustainable credentials because of 
the gaps, you know, contamination at the level of blending, re-blending, so on and so forth. So that could potentially help. And second, if you have a very clear, uh, you know, certification standards, which are underlying that, uh, which has the social aspect to it, which uh, several of the uh, textile exchange standard has, that also helps to drive, uh, you know, fair distribution and economic uh, sustainability towards uh, either farmers or towards, you know, uh, the rest of the textile supply chain. I think also to add to that is the yeah. visibility and the stories from um, from the farmers themselves. Uh, often case, the, the stories of the farmers, um, they're, they're the invisible sort of hand um, and contributing to the supply chain. Um, and, you know, uh, a, a transparent and traceable platform will sort of highlight, uh, you know, some of uh, what is happening at the at the farm level as well. Yeah, no, no, true, very true. Then the next question is from Nicholas Allen. I think I know him. So hi, Nicholas. <laughs> <laughs> hi, Nick. Yes. Um, yeah. No, so you, this is for you, Ivan. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Um, <sighs> Can you expand on how textile genesis could improve the TC system? Um, it could because right now, if we look at um, transaction certificates, um, transaction certificates are basically an aggregation of a number of uh, quite a number of shipments, and the shipments are an aggregation of the number of um, transactions of a particular product. Um, basically, if we remove the entire boundary of a transaction certificate, we therefore no, no longer need um, to, to, to wait for the aggregation. Uh, so that's one thing. Um, so by, you're still tracing it, but you're tracing it rather than a transaction certificate level, you're tracing it at the lowest level, which is a, a digital asset level. So by doing that, um, that information flow, you basically don't have to wait for, um, you know, two shipments to pass or three shipments to pass before you enter that information and that information could be passed through. So that's one aspect. The second aspect really is to uh, leverage some of the, the technologies, uh, automation and systemization to directly communicate um, between ERP systems um, via bots um, so that you don't have to, you know, sort of double entry. So if you, um, uh, some of the information that is used to validate a particular transaction are things like purchase orders, um, you know, in, invoices, um, and you know, if a system can a system can be validated against another system, uh, and that uh, interface is already uh, sort of authenticated and validated, then that information flow can happen quite quickly. So that's another aspect as well. So the, the manual um, uh, involvement in that uh, could also reduce uh, accuracy would go up. And, um, and with that also the, the reconciliation of the numbers and the, uh, the checking, um, the manual checking would also reduce. Um, so these are some of the areas that we're, we're exploring to um, address. Does that answer your question? Yeah, hopefully it, um, it does. I think, uh, thanks Yvonne. So I think you address it quite well. Uh, then if we uh, move on, how can uh, technical textile be sustainable for long run as we use long synthetic fiber? So I'm not sure if, uh, I mean, I could take on that because I'm not really a specialist in technical textile, but uh, no, very briefly, there are a lot of very special fibers used there. Uh, and I guess it kind of beyond the scope of uh, what I or Yvonne could uh, address here, Yvonne. Is that correct? Um, I must say I am not a, uh, <laughs> a textile engineer by yeah. background. So I will log this answer and get back to you yeah. on this. Yeah. yeah. Especially because it goes into this technical textile, you know, maybe firefighting. And, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, and fabrics. Okay. Uh, how you use the textile token? I think this question comes back later when uh, uh, the question is addressed, how do we use the fiber token? So if you just hold on to that question, Dan, because we address in our third webinar, we exactly go into that specific topic, how 
uh, the fiber coins or fiber tokens are used. So, uh, Stacy, Rune, yes, Yvonne. Yeah, so Stacy, um, you ask what, could you explain risk-based verification and how it helps to ensure trust in the blockchain technology? So, um, yeah, so in terms of risk-based verification, uh, I, I think you can probably take it from two perspectives. Uh, one, one is the sort of pure technology point of view, um, um, which if you use, uh, you know, certain algorithms in place, you can um, derive certain disanalysis of uh, um, supply chain entities um, that have higher risk and therefore those are the ones that you zoom in whereas the system on its whole will will do the uh, reconciliation and the systemization of data between uh, the two systems um, you know pulling in then the certification bodies we're not really um, removing the need yeah. for third party yeah. assurance at all um, and that is still really really important, especially for textile exchanges standards. Um, but what that means is that they can zoom in and, and really uh, hone in on, you know, the area that requires attention. Um, and the, uh, the, the, the technology will, you know, um, guide them towards that kind of risk-based analysis uh, and verification. Um, Amit, do you want to add to that? No, I think they are uh, exactly right. I think they just kind of uh, make each of them more robust, right? So if you have more risk-based verification, you can do more uh, uh, targeted uh, verification. And then therefore it makes the, uh, the digital data more robust because then it increases the confidence and it also creates a very strong deterrence in the mind of uh, the players who might be trying to game the system because they know that it can be actually uh, caught and therefore uh, have you know penalties associated to it. Uh, Malvina Hoxha, hi Malvina, hope you're doing well in New York. Hi Amit, how do you see this technology playing out in global wool market? Uh, great, so we have uh, looked into uh, wool market very carefully, uh, have conducted several uh, traceability pilots from uh, RWS certified uh, tops manufacturers, RWS certified farms uh, up to retail. And then we'll be uh, now looking at more practical aspect, as Yvonne pointed out, of how can we dovetail with the uh, with the existing uh, 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 you know standard that's in place uh, from textile exchange. But I see a lot of relevance uh, for the global wool market uh, because that's another area where we see uh, especially fine merino wool and uh, cashmere. Uh, you know uh, we see areas where uh, uh, either con contamination from blinding or pure outright uh, counterfeiting is happening. And uh, our objective would be to be able to protect that, plus also communicate the story of the, the sheep grower towards consumers at the point of sale and have hopefully then drive better uh, 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 you know, sustainability from economic and social standpoint uh, for them as well. Uh, then, then, how are we doing on time? Oh, six more minutes, right? So then, Dan, as I understood, you have a token from permissionless chain used in a permissioned blockchain. Uh, so Dan, uh, no, we don't use from a permissionless chain, which I think what you mean is uh, a Ethereum or a Bitcoin. We do not use a permissionless chain. We actually create tokens in a hyperledger uh, through a smart contract, right? So that's what we have uh, done. These are fungible tokens connected to the assets there. Yeah. Uh, Yvonne, do you want to take on the next one and then I'll build on that? Um, how would Jeff, Jeffrey Wilson, how would you describe the difference between blockchain and the various types of traces out there, such as DNA um, and nanomaterials? So traces is a, is a, is a type of um, technology, if you will, that allows you to authenticate. Now, there are, there are two aspects to it. Um, um, one is the incorporation of that information into the information flow. Um, so 
uh, that is one aspect. And the second aspect of it really is to define requirements for those baselines. So, um, you know, that's where the standards kick in. And in terms of, you know, how that information is incorporated within the information flow, thereby increasing the integrity of that information across the supply chain. So um, they play different roles. Um, uh, the blockchain ensures that the information travels uh, across the uh, supply chain accurately. Um, and, you know, uh, DNA traces or other physical traces, um, you know, they provide you sort of a, a spot check at certain part of the supply chain um, and uh, for the authentication of the physical material itself. Yeah. Next question, uh, Susan, um, how do you imagine integrating the digital and physical all the way along the supply chain? If you start with organic cotton, then it's blended with other batches of cotton and or fibers and spun. How do you keep track of where each batch goes? Um, okay, so uh, in terms of um, complete traceability, there will need to have three elements and, and I mean, you can and chip in on this one. Um, in terms of complete traceability, if you specifically want to know the exact farm that it comes from, it will be slightly uh, challenging because you know, if you have ever been to a, a, a gin, um, the, the the um, the cottons when they collect the cottons and the cotton is delivered to the gin, they come in batches and lorries. Um, it is still possible uh, if you have a uh, solution, a technology solution in place to to track the delivery uh, of every single batch. Again, if you uh, add in tracer technology into the mix, you can then validate that that particular batch um, is then. Um, you know, from that particular farm itself. Um, you know, a number of, and, and then of course, if you, if you use uh, sort of a, a blockchain or, you know, a, a, a very good or sound chain of custody system, you can then track that information throughout the supply chain. It doesn't address, however, the cost of all of that. Um, you know, what it, what it really does mean to, to have complete traceability with the blending and, and uh, tracking. It is possible, um, so, uh, but you know, at the moment, the majority of it is segregated and not sort of traceability down to, you know, which farm, and especially if it's a small scale farm, which specific farm it comes from. It is probably more achievable um, in uh, areas like the United States, um, where, you know, um, the farms are generally large scale in nature, um, you know, uh, for that to happen. So right, I think we can probably take one more question before the end of the uh, call, Yvonne. Okay. Um, how, from Anaka, how can technical textiles become sustainable as we are using PPE kits, which are non-biodegradable? Um, I'm going to have to defer that question to one of the textile engineers from Textile Exchange uh, because, again, um, unfortunately, I, I don't have the, the textile engineering background uh, for that. Uh, so the last one is about textile genesis. So Amit, you can take that and then I will call it. Mm -hmm. um, Right. Okay. So how does uh, TG deal with aggregation and disaggregation events in manufacturing when considering traceability, uh, does it permit 100% permit traceability for a finished good through its entire supply chain? So yes, it permits 100% uh, traceability for a finished good uh, when we get all the uh, relevant uh, players along the supply chain into the system. It, it, it's fiber forward approach to traceability real time instead of garment backwards. And whatever shipment is being uh, sent from uh, any step in the value chain, uh, which is after aggregation and disaggregation is captured at the level of purchase order invoice and shipment reference number. And that's how it then creates uh, uh, the traceability. And that's how it takes care of 
aggregation and disaggregation because after that is when the actual shipment happens and that's what we actually capture. So I'll pass it on back then to uh, uh, maybe one you want to share the, uh, about the upcoming webinars. Right. So for those, um, yeah, coming up next is the transparency, how it is shaping the textile value chain. Um, that's on August 5th, same time as today's webinar. And the last one is uh, some of the findings or key findings or outcomes uh, from the assessment uh, through the textile exchange and textile genesis collaboration. That's on September 2nd. So on that note, uh, we thank you all for joining us today. For those who questions you have <coughs> not answered, we'll get back to you, uh, Rose. Yes, you. thank you to Amit and Yvonne for um, speaking today. And thank you for participating in today's webinar. And again, as Yvonne mentioned, as a friendly reminder, all unanswered questions will be answered via email. And an email will be sent to all registered participants with links to today's presentation. That concludes our webinar. Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Bye.